The God Emperor's Most Holy Inquisition. Humanity's first, last, and let us be perfectly honest, only true line of defense against the alien, the mutant, and the heretic. Oh sure, brightly colored space marines and shiny gray knights are all well and good, but these are blunt instruments that need wielding, that need direction and priorities. As the best they can usually do is rectify the situation when it is already far too late. The Grey Knights can teleport down onto a world infested with demons and ensure they do not destroy yet further Imperial worlds. Similarly, the Space Marine can crush Xeno's horde beneath their power armored boots and take back worlds lost to the Imperium through the perfidious infiltration of alien horrors. These are not insignificant contributions to the great cause of the God Emperor, of course, but they are, at the end of the day, damage control. Necessary, but far from perfect. Meanwhile, it is the Inquisition's purpose to prevent disasters before they arise. And only the Inquisition has the expertise, the power, the ability, and the drive to detect that Chaos Cult before they open a portal capable of swallowing an entire planet. Only the Inquisition is able to detect the subtle hints of alien influence on a planetary governor and have him assassinated before he can turn his world over to the clutches of the alien. Yet, it is a thankless task, an endless task, and one of near infinite complexity. Even the Inquisition is not perfect. They cannot prevent every catastrophe, and on more than one occasion they have been the root cause of calamity themselves. See, for example, the war for Badab. The Inquisition was far from guiltless in the war that claimed the lives of thousands of loyal Astartes. Billions of Imperial Guard soldiers and pitted brother against brother in a civil war that laid waste to one of the most resource rich sectors in the Imperium, causing near unimaginable damage to the overall war effort. And all over the hubris of a handful of individuals. Nevertheless, for all their scope and scale, the Inquisition's successes far outnumber their failings. And without the Inquisition, humanity would surely have long since been lost to the darkness of laughing gods. So today, we are going to have a look at this pillar of humanity's very existence in the 41st millennium. Its organization, its powers, and its history. And we might as well, as always, start at the very beginning, when the Inquisition was not the Inquisition at all, but rather an ad hoc organization formed by Malkador the Sigilite on the direct order of the Emperor. This organization was known as the Knights Errants. <laughs> and frankly, even calling it an organization is overselling it significantly, as in reality it was no more than a handful of individuals operating as the agents of Malkador during the darkest days of the Horus Heresy. These original members were selected for their loyalty, their courage, strength, and above all, inquisitive nature. Originally, they were all space marines, first from the Crusader host, members of the traitor legions that had remained loyal. But over the course of the heresy, their ranks expanded, and would eventually even include mere mortals. 
The Knights Errants would carry out several missions during the war, many of pivotal importance to the eventual outcome. Until, right before the final siege of Terra, the Knights Errants were split into two further organizations. Eight Space Marines would go on to be the original founders of the Grey Knights. The Imperium's ultimate weapon against chaos and the demon. They were sent to the planet Titan, where a secret stronghold had been created for them, and their very existence would be kept a well-guarded secret for a very, very long time. A further eight mortal members of the Twelve Chosen, however, would go on to create the foundation that was to become the Inquisition, either directly or indirectly. As there are rumors of a split amongst these original four Inquisitors, two arguing for the creation of the traditional Inquisition as we know it today, and two arguing for a more esoterical approach. One of them would presumably fall to chaos, the other would create a large galaxy-spanning faction that would eventually be reintegrated into the Inquisition as the Resurrectionist faction, whose goal was to find a way to resurrect the God Emperor. But we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. These two more radical members left Terra, whilst the other two remained behind to introduce and integrate themselves into the Senatorum Imperialis, the ruling body of the Imperium after the Emperor's ascension to the Golden Throne. Within the Senatorum Imperialis, they would then work to create the Inquisition proper, which would only fully take form sometime in the 32nd millennium. At that point, the Imperium, the Senatorum Imperialis, and the Inquisition had all changed quite radically. The Inquisition's overarching goal to protect the Imperium and the Emperor's vision against threats both from the inside and out remained the same, but the ways in which they went about it and the threats they were expecting to face bore little resemblance to the traitor legions of the Horus Heresy. One of the few things that truly linked them back to their past then was the sigil of Malkador the Sigilite, which was now the official symbol of the Inquisition, and can be seen today on the Inquisitorial Rosette. The badge of office and symbol of absolute authority that the Inquisition has fashioned for itself. As in those early days, there wasn't actually all that much in the way of an overt threat to the Imperium. After the defeat and the scattering of the traitor legions, the only clear military danger had seemingly been defeated. The loss of the Emperor as the overall leader of the Imperium, however, was a tremendous blow, and nobody truly knew how to carry on without him. The Senatorum Imperialis and the Adeptus Administratum were of course brainchilds of himself and Malkador, but the very process of governing a galaxy-spanning empire via democratic means was essentially impossible. Even in the early, heady days of optimism and victory, where everyone was undoubtedly trying their genuine best, common interests swiftly fell to the side for personal gain, personal glory, and political power. With the rise of the imperial cult deifying the god emperor, this only grew more complicated. After all, what place does a church have in a secular empire? A specifically, expressly secular empire by the wishes of the emperor. But well, was he even the emperor anymore? Was he now not the god emperor? <laughs> Would anyone argue that his feats, his deeds were anything less than divine? And if they tried, their popularity in an ostensibly democratic system would not last long. 
It was therefore quite unavoidable that eventually the imperial cult would rise to a position of prominent political power, and at a later date, one that directly endangered the very imperium and the emperor it sought to worship, but we'll touch upon that a little bit later on. In this setting of subterfuge and political intrigue, the Inquisition was more worried about internal enemies than external ones. Traitors, zealots, destabilizing elements, those who had perhaps a bit too much ambition for the Imperium's good. It was, however, a very difficult game the Inquisition was playing. They needed to strike a very subtle and nuanced balance. The ideal of the Emperor was for the people's rule of the Imperium. The Imperium was to be the Imperium of humanity, rather than that of a handful of bureaucrats at the top. Yet at the same time, unfettered ambition would inevitably lead to tyranny and might place the Imperium in considerable danger was a suitable external threat to ever arise again. At the time it seemed an impossibility, there was no remaining Xenos force to oppose the Imperium, the Orcs were viewed as next to exterminated, the traitor legions had fled into the eyes of terror hundreds of years previously, except for a few holdouts here and there, and were expected to have simply perished within its baleful glare. And then the War of the Beast rolled around. <laughs> you will excuse me if I don't delve too deeply into those details because, God, Emperor, help me, I hate the War of the Beasts. It is in many ways one of the worst pieces of writing in the entire history of 40k, but there were some interesting points as well. For example, there were a great deal of individuals who wished to rise very rapidly, who believed that their interpretation of what was right for the Imperium was the only correct one and caused a great deal of damage in turn. Even those who appeared at first to be the reasonable and heroic individuals ended up becoming not quite so heroic, leading to mass-scale purges of the leadership of the Imperium. Hashtag Draken Vangerich did nothing wrong. <laughs> Yet, nevertheless, in light of the need to kill 99% of the Imperium's higher-ups, the Inquisition came to the conclusion that something had clearly gone very wrong, as this was precisely the kind of debacle they had been created to explicitly prevent, as it had placed the Imperium in a tremendous amount of danger. Not only had they missed the growing instability within the Imperium, they had also failed to notice the beasts, which Again, was a gathering of Orc Primarchs. Please, dear God Emperor, strike me down for the idiocy I must speak. <clears throat> and so, the Inquisition agreed to split into two. Where one, the old primary branch, would remain focused on the greater enemy, Chaos. It would be the Ordo Malus, and its chamber militant would be the recently rediscovered Grey Knights. Whereas the second Ordo would become known as Ordo Xenos, and it would focus on the eradication of the alien, and making sure that no surprise like the Beast could ever happen again. To do this, they took the Death Watch as their chamber militants, with the Death Watch being a recently created organization drawing its members from various Astartes chapters and specializing them in defeating alien enemies. But with this, surely all angles were thoroughly covered, and the modern day proper full force Inquisition was formed with the Ordo Malus keeping close eye on Chaos, and the Ordo Xenos keeping the alien in check. 
But hold on a moment. We are forgetting something, aren't we? Oh yes, the heretic. As tragically, in the 36th millennium, the Inquisition repeated its error. Ordo Malus was too busy dealing with demons and Xenos with alien threats to notice the rise of Gog Vandir of the Ecclesiarchy, which had now grown into an enormous power structure within the Imperium, allowing him and his self-serving interpretation of Imperial faith to become the single most powerful political faction in the Imperium, allowing Gog Vandir to declare himself sole lord and master of terror of the Administratum, the Ecclesiarchy and the Imperium as a whole splitting the God Emperor's domain in twain in civil war. A conflict that would last for damn near a hundred years and would not be ended by the armies of Sebastian Thor and the Confederation of Light, the opposing true faith faction, but instead by Gog Vandir's own bodyguards, his zealously faithful Daughters of the Emperor, who killed the apostate after finally learning who he truly was. The Daughters of the Emperor would later go on to become the Adepta Sororitas, the brand new chamber militants of the Third Ordo of the Inquisition, Hereticus. And finally, now, we have the birth of the modern day Inquisition, made up by the three primary orders, Xenos, Malus, and Hereticus, the so-called Ordos Majoris, as they represent the three primary threats arrayed against the Imperium, and the three threats against which the Emperor had originally warned. But that is not to say that the Inquisition is made up of only these three. Oh, no, 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 far from it. In fact, one can view the Inquisition as a nation within a nation. It is, for all its relative compactness, still a massive organization. Even if Inquisitors and their agents make up no more than 0.0 something percent of the overall Imperial populace, that's still counted in the trillions upon trillions. And so the internal workings of the Inquisition, its organization and its logistics is still an enormous undertaking, with thousands, probably tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of Inquisitors and millions of agents scattered all throughout the Imperium, carrying out their own duties and tasks, many of which are self-made, as there is very little in the way of an overarching governing body with within the Inquisition. By and large, Inquisitors are trusted to go about their business in the greater good of the Imperium without any real former oversight. In such an environment, it's not much of a miracle that many, 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 many diverging points of views have formed. In many cases, these will organize into factions within the Inquisition. We've already talked about one of these and we will be covering a lot more, and on other occasions they might form into so-called Ordo Minoris. These are the variants on the main orders that are usually created for a particular purpose, a express point of view, or a specific objective. For example, the Ordo Sicarius was made expressly to deal with Imperial assassins, moderating their usage, controlling their usage, and making sure that they were applied correctly against the right targets, and that they were not being abused for personal um, advancement. 
It also gives us a, another example of the intricacies of the Inquisition, as the Ordo Sicarius was originally founded as a additional law placed upon the higher lords of Terra, essentially saying that any and all deployments of Officio Assassinarum adepts must be approved by a majority vote of the higher lords of Terra. The idea was good because, well, it added in a democratic element to the process of assassination. Only if you can convince a majority of the higher lords that an individual must die can the adepts of the officio be dispatched. The problem, however, swiftly became that... <laughs> There are thousands of individuals in the Imperium that need assassinating every single damn solitary day. <laughs> Again, it's the same issue with that ruling the Imperium via purely democratic means is de facto impossible because it's just that god damn large. And so quickly, the Ordo Sicarius had to begin modifying their own rules and regulations. Okay, maybe official assassinations must be approved in this way, but perhaps the Ordo could be given the de facto power to rubber stamp one or two assassinations here and there, you know, just to smooth them through the system a little bit, and soon as the requests for assassinations mounted, the Ordo devolved into little more than a mass rubber stamping machine, proving that even though they might be doing things with the best of intentions, the Inquisition is not always flawless in its execution. On other occasions, Ordos can be created to deal with specific threats, as mentioned. Perhaps there is a particularly nasty Xenos invasion, like, for example, the Tyranids. That's a threat that would absolutely warrant a specialized Ordo carrying out investigations into the true nature of the Tyranids, what kind of weapons could potentially kill them, how to best fight them, and evaluate the various strategies used against them. On other occasion, a Ordo Minoris might be created for a wider field of research where there isn't necessarily a direct goal in mind, they don't know really how to do what they're planning to do, but you've got to start somewhere, and so you could create something like the Ordo Maledictium, which is trying to research a way to fix GW's latest plot point. <laughs> Excuse me, the Great Rift, of course. How to close it, or at the very least, diminish its effect upon the Imperium. And bear you in mind as well that uh, the goals and aims of these minor orders are not always quite so wholesome or universally good. In many cases, orders can be created, well, at purposes directly at odds with the overarching goals of the Imperium, dependent upon the various factions' intent. For example, a minor Ordos can be created primarily from the Xanthites. That was the faction that I've talked about previously in a video that believes that chaos can be fought with chaos, because, well, it works, it is undeniably effective, and so surely the Inquisition, whose primary purpose it is to defeat chaos, should use its most effective weapon against it. But this is, as mentioned, a rather radical interpretation of the Inquisition's goals and aims, and so, unavoidably, there would be other factions and probably minor orders created to keep an eye on the Santhites, perhaps even to directly counteract their actions, as conflict between Inquisitors is a relative rarity, but far, far from unknown. And such internal disagreements can be devastating, due to the powers granted to an Inquisitor. We haven't even talked about that yet, so let's dive into it a little bit so that you can fully understand the potential scope and scale of a disagreement within the various orders. An Inquisitor's power is de facto 
limitless. They carry with them the literal authority of the God Emperor himself. There is no door they are not allowed to open. There is no army they cannot command. There is no power within the Imperium they cannot bring to bear. Barring political considerations, that is, as there are certain organizations that consider themselves, if not above the Inquisition, then at the very least in a position to be asked for their assistance rather than compelled to provide it. But by and large, an Inquisitor's power is, for all regular intents and purposes, boundless. Now again, there are certain political limitations. A lower ranking Inquisitor will certainly face some blowback if he decides to simply requisition an Emperor class battleship out of nowhere, but he could do it. And a higher ranking Inquisitor, it wouldn't be rare at all for him to own a warship or two. Some maintain de facto private armies of specially trained operatives and soldiers to be used and deployed at their discretion. Furthermore, Inquisitors can requisition any Imperial Guard formation they want and as many as they want. They can call down exterminators on entire planets if there is no immediate military solution. And all of this has absolutely zero oversight beyond the actual Inquisition itself. An Inquisitor can accuse another Inquisitor of malfeasance, which will lead to a conclave, which is a topic I'll probably be covering a bit more detail later on. But beyond that, beyond one Inquisitor coming for another Inquisitor, there is no higher authority. And this is a necessary level of power. Say, for example, that an Inquisitor unveils a plot to overthrow a local planet. Well, he could call back to HQ on Terra for permission. It would take days, weeks, months, years, with the bureaucracy of the Imperium. He could request uh, Imperial Guard forces, and maybe five years later when it has made its way to the top of the pile and some form of Imperial Guard presence can actually be created, it'll be far too late. This is why they can go straight to the local garrison commander and simply demand to be given their men which can then be used to crush the insurrectionists, the heretics, the traitors, the Xenos infiltrators, whatever it may be. This has even led to some Inquisitors carrying out their well, very own little wars, as we saw on Vrax and on an even larger scale in Badab. But there is of course a problem, there is a drawback to all of this. Whilst an Inquisitor may wield obvious power, and many do as well, there are problems with this. If an Inquisitor shows up in orbit over a planet with half a dozen escorts in tow, with a grand cruiser as their flagship, and imposes a massive military blockade on the planet with literal dozens of Imperial Guard regiments and specialized formations of Tempestus stormtroopers, any heretical element is uh, likely to go pretty damn deep underground, pretty damn immediately. Of course, if the Inquisitor is absolutely sure in his case, he could just blow up the planet, <laughs> but even in the Imperium, as vast as it is, Planets are kind of rare resources, and actions on the scale of an exterminator's is very likely to bring some attention to it. In fact, there are entire minor orders within the Inquisition dedicated to the duty of double-checking whenever an exterminator's order is issued and making sure that it was actually for a good reason. As, well, if it isn't, you can imagine what kind of damage a rogue Inquisitor could do with that kind of power. Yeah, you, uh, you'd want to double check. But again, the issue is that even if you know there is a heretical presence on a world, 
if you've driven it so deep underground that it's going to take months, if not years, of mass-scale military investigation, full-on occupation of a planet, Odds are you're going to be doing more damage than good. The Imperium does not exist in a vacuum, nor does any individual planet within it. If an Inquisitor needs to carry out a year-long military occupation of a world, that world's produce, its contribution to the overall war effort, will inevitably diminish. The populace might even be destabilized by what they would see, not surprisingly so, as pretty overt tyrannical measures being taken against them. No matter how loyal the populace might be, oppress them hard enough for long enough, and if there wasn't a traitorous force on the planet, there will be one now. Of course, there are occasions in which the old hammer approach is absolutely necessary. Say, for example, that a local cult has grown to the point where it is just about to launch its coup attempt against local authorities. They might have entire armies of rebels ready to go, fully armed, trained, and prepared. In such a case, a single Inquisitor showing up with 12 adepts... <laughs> isn't going to do shit except increase the casualty statistics by 13. Bring an army, however, and you might just have a shooting chance. But, on the flip side, if there isn't a rebellion in the offing, a more subtle approach might be uh, considerably more productive. There is a general divide in philosophy between Inquisitors, and it tends to be one of seniority as well, quite frequently, where younger, more, um, let's not say naive, um, optimistic inquisitors will try to root out the rot from the stem, rather than simply burn the entire field. In the case of a secretive cabal plotting an uprising, they will try and figure out precisely who is doing the plotting, and decapitate the entire organization at the top, or if necessary, burn it out, cell by cell, piece by piece. Some of these investigations can take decades, centuries even. There are certain cults, for example, within the Imperium, heretical cults specifically, mind you, that have spread across dozens, perhaps hundreds of worlds, all of which are carefully closed off and compartmentalized. Even if the Inquisition manages to break open a major cell, there is absolutely no guarantee that it is connected in any substantial fashion to any others. Luckily for the Imperium, it is a rare cult indeed that grows to that level of organization and sophistication, as most are fairly localized entities. But that does not mean that they are easy to discover either. Consider, for example, our current history. You have certain crimes that are outright protected by the majority of the population because they are in alignment with the population's prevailing views in the immediate area. To take an example from our current day history, let's see, something thematic. Ah, I know, a nice and controversial one too, the Ku Klux Klan. There you go. They are pretty universally accepted as bad guys today, for fairly good reasons, I'd go so far as to say. Yet, at the height of their power and local influence, they were by many considered to be the heroes. No matter how ridiculous it might seem today, there was a time when the movie The Birth of a Nation, for example, was released, and it was controversial because there were a lot of people who agreed with its heroic representation of the clan. It was deeply entrenched in the local area, and was protected by law enforcement, politicians, even just regular run-of-the-mill people. In these circumstances, it is very difficult to actually get to grip with the organization itself. It is certainly extremely difficult to try and 
arrest them, to try and bring them to justice or any other such thing. Imagine something like that, but on the scale of a planet. This cult has worked its way into the very core of imperial society on that planet. They know their neighbours, they know their politicians, they know local law enforcement. The cultist is simply just Jeff down the street. He's never done nothing wrong. Yeah, sure, he has some weird beliefs, but he's harmless, right? Except for the glowing shrine in Jeff's basement, that is. For an outsider, then, an inquisitor that might hail from the other end of the galaxy, to come into that society, that world, and know nothing about local customs, local culture, tradition, hell, even the local language, and root out a deeply subversive and entrenched cult, one that has made it its job to make friends and stay as hidden as possible, it is a damn near impossible task, and only extraordinarily skilled, driven, and experienced individuals will have any real chance. And how often the Inquisition actually succeeds in their investigations, well, who even knows? It's not like they keep uh, public records. But of course, again, bringing an army will make everything a lot more difficult. You will immediately be perceived as not just the outsider, but the outside oppressive force. No matter how many Aquilas you wave around, or how many people you show your Rosaria to, you will always be the outsider who brought an army. This is why a lot of Inquisitors employ specialized personnel with a great deal of intelligence gathering training. Maybe even people who are able to go to a planet and establish a local network of informants and spy specialists, training them to know what to look for, in what areas, and to sort out the false positives from the genuine returns. For many Inquisitors, it is their entire life's work to build up vast, intricate spider webs of these intelligence gathering specialists scattered across dozens of worlds, capable of chasing down leads, no matter how small or ephemeral, and pursuing them to the very source of the disturbance. If it's false positive, the Inquisitor might never even know about it, but if it's a cult, he will know where to look, to focus his effort and his resources. In many cases, these networks will be created before there is even a suspicion of heresy or malcontent, because Inquisitors tend to be a um, inquisitive and suspicious lot, and the sooner you get your people embedded onto an objective, the quicker you're going to see returns. And hey, if the locals have nothing to hide, they have nothing to fear. <laughs> These more generalized networks are usually also either headed up or led directly by specialized high-ranking inquisitorial agents. For whilst not all inquisitors bother with the whole information gathering aspect, some are literal blunt objects, simply trusting the rubble will crush the rebels right alongside the citizenry, but all Inquisitors have a stable of talented individuals that they use as their agents. The qualifier for selecting an agent can vary drastically from Inquisitor to Inquisitor. The more blunt object types would undoubtedly favour fighting skill, strategic competence, or tactical brilliance, for example. Uh, personal champions from barbarian hellscape worlds, maybe even um, failed aspirants from Astartes chapters, or maybe even straight up space marines in some cases. Whereas a more subtle inquisitor might employ people with particular gifts like perfect recall, allowing them to act as living libraries, or people who are skilled infiltrators as spies. Some even employ more dubious means like mutants or psychers. For example, one of the most prized assets of any inquisitor would be a blank. 
psychic. An exceptionally rare psychic mutation that nullifies the influence of the warp and psychic powers in a sphere around them. To an inquisitor of the Ordo Malus in particular, such a talent would be of immeasurable value, more than a regiment of Imperial Guard, more than any warship, more than a titan. But even to other inquisitors, the obvious value of somebody capable of nullifying psychic powers is, well, obvious. And most inquisitors tend to go to considerable length to secure these individuals and preferably to keep them secret because mm, other inquisitors might be interested in acquiring them for their own uses and sometimes are none too shy about the methods employed in the acquisition. Returning us a bit to that idea then of inquisitorial conflict. Now that you have a bit of an idea of their power and authority, limitless, <laughs> and their access to resources, well, imagine this. Imagine a couple of nations with access to you know, America-level powers. They can have whatever they want. They possess the top of the line in everything. In weaponry, in training, in agents, in resources, in everything. Literally, straight up. Now imagine those forces deciding to go to war with one another. <laughs> And you've got an inquisitorial conflict. Now, mind you, they tend to be a bit more um, delicate. Not necessarily for lack of violence or murder, bloodshed, maiming or assassinations, but with plausible deniability. When one Inquisitor attacks another, he would prefer to do it as a smashing knockout blow, a straight up kill, the destruction of their entire network overnight. This would be the culmination of decades of investigation, of careful planning and targeting, of discovering all of the opposition's assets, many of which will be in deep, deep cover and absolute secrecy, and then annihilating all of it immediately trying to use as little official power as possible. The more of this you keep in-house, using your own agents and your own direct subordinates, the less chance of your um, actions becoming public knowledge within the Inquisition. But it isn't entirely um, unknown either for Inquisitors to straight up throw Imperial military assets at one another, though at that point things have escalated quite drastically and the likelihood of the rest of the Inquisition getting involved has also risen to an uncomfortable level. As mentioned, there is quite a lot of internal politicking within the Inquisition, and whilst there is technically not a whole lot of a rank structure beyond Inquisitor and Inquisitor Lord, there absolutely is a hierarchy, and a more senior Inquisitor can and is expected to rein in his uh, juniors if they're getting a little bit out of hand. In other words, an Inquisitor can absolutely be brought to heel by a theoretical superior and told to cease whatever nonsense they've been engaged in. Another reason why they prefer for a conflict to be a swift, immediate, one-sided knockout blow, so as to avoid any political blowback. After all, if a victor has already been declared, no point in dragging up the politics of it. In the case of a protracted conflict, however, it is likely to be brought to a halt by senior parties in both political circles, assuming that one or the other doesn't have a clear advantage. If this is a conflict between two factions of the Inquisition, where one is radically more powerful than the other, they can probably run enough ass covering to continue even a straight up shooting war for an extended period. But by and large, two bickering inquisitors will be told to cut it out. After which, they will continue attacking one another, but more subtly this time. Proper truces and genuine ceasefires, and maybe even outright peace amongst inquisitors, is <laughs> rare. 
it, um, it takes a certain kind of individual to be a good Inquisitor, and that individual is not one that, uh, you know, lets bygones be bygones. Not the forgiving sort, nor the um, surrendering sort. These conflicts can also be brought up in a full-on conclave, a inquisitorial court, essentially, where the accusing party and the accused party will be given the opportunity to attack one another, verbally in this case, although frequent assassination attempts are also very traditional and, well, more or less accepted, so long as neither party gets caught, of course, and if, during the deliberation of the judges, one side is found to be guilty or to have brought false charges, that tends to be the end of one or the other's career permanently, and usually fatally. Luckily, most Inquisitors will view these kinds of internal bickerings, at least to this degree, as fairly wasteful, and certainly not something that would um, further their overall goals. Though Inquisitors tend to grow a bit more radical over the years, and tend to consider more radical off-the-book solutions as well. Still, most Inquisitors will busy themselves with the day-to-day -day of actually protecting the Empyrean, and rooting out the traitor, the heretic, and the Xenos. But how exactly do they do this? Well, we've already talked a little bit about the building of intelligence networks, but how do they find the agents, or acolytes, or servants that they use to do this? Well, obviously they're going to need to recruit them. Now, there is no standardized method of recruitment within the Inquisition, because again, every Inquisitor has absolute authority. He gets to recruit whoever he wants, wherever he wants, however he wants, for whatever reason he wants. This includes Imperial military personnel, even from the Adepta Sororitas, even the Space Marines, though in those cases, it tends to be a request for cooperation rather than an outright order. I guess we could talk a little bit about the friction between Inquisitors and Adeptus Astartes as well, although I feel like that might be a broader separate topic, but in broad generalistic terms, the Inquisition's absolute authority is absolute. However, the Space Marines also have their ancient rights to self-governance. They get to operate their own campaigns. They have the rights to their recruiting worlds, and they get to pick when and where they fight and who they fight. So when an Inquisitor shows up and demands their service, they tend to uh, get a bit on the back leg about it. Now, not all, hashtag, not all space marines, there are certain chapters that have excellent working uh, relationships with the Inquisition who would be honored to send one of their battle brothers to serve as an inquisitorial agent, whereas others have very hostile relationships with the Inquisition and view their powers as an imposition upon their own hereditary and ancient rights. Many chapters with more controversial traditions also tend to view the Inquisitors as well, outright threats, frankly, and more than one or two chapters have actually been declared excommunicatus traitoris and purged by the Inquisition, not always for particularly good reason. By that same uh, reason and logic, however, there are a fair few Inquisitors as well that have found themselves the accidental victim of Walter fire whilst on campaign, or having been flushed out an airlock via malfunctioning servitors trying to gain the cooperation of um, stubborn chapters. Really, if an Inquisitor super, super, super duper wants a superhuman bodyguard, he'd be best served by going to one of the chamber militants, like the Death Watch, for example, or the Sisters of Battle. The Grey Knights are gonna be a tougher sell, but there are some Inquisitors that are respected enough by even the Valiant Masters of Titan to... Well, Grey Knights are far too valuable to be set aside for bodyguard service, but they will operate alongside the Inquisitor, and even take suggestions as to where they should go next. But 
To row on back to the topic of agents and acolytes, as mentioned, Inquisitors can recruit whoever they want. But obviously they are looking for quality, exceptional individuals of exceptional talent. This is also one of the benefits of having a nice wide agent network, the ability to actually detect these individuals. Now some are more obvious than others, for example, almost all Inquisitors are going to have several astropaths and sanctioned psychers and navigators at their disposal, for travel, communication, secretive projects and battlefield power as well. They will also tend to have a nice solid amount of dedicated fighters, because even the most subtle and intrigue-oriented Inquisitor knows that sometimes you're gonna have to actually shoot the heretic yourself. And on that topic, Inquisitors are also of course expected to be able to deal with the enemies of the Imperium directly. As such, they will often have a stable of armsmen, of smiths, of armorers, of special technicians, or of brokers to gain them the various resources they need. Perhaps an Inquisitor favours a bolt pistol loaded with exquisitely crafted master bolter rounds, maybe even homing ammunition, or bullets specifically blessed by holy men to defeat demons, etc, etc. Shit that the normal normal fighting man would not even dream of possessing is just a finger snap away for the Inquisition. But beyond these specialists, be they combat or support oriented, there is also a, another class of inquisitorial adepts, agents, namely the Inquisitor's successor. Because of course you might be wondering, how the hell is an Inquisitor actually created? How are they selected? How does anyone know who to give limitless authority to? Sounds like a dangerous game, doesn't it? Is there some kind of academy somewhere, a school, a selection process? Not Really. Again, every Inquisitor is free to do this in whatever way he wants, though it's not quite so easy to actually give a um, worthy acolyte and apprentice the full Inquisitorial seal. Most Inquisitors will pick out a certain individual, usually amongst long-serving and trusted retainers, and begin grooming them for the position of successor. These are often given special titles like uh, interrogator, or novitz, neophytes, etc, etc. Though this title can of course be revoked at any time and grants the individual no extra powers whatsoever. It is simply an acknowledgement that they might be in the running for the Rosetta, should they ever be deemed worthy. Some Inquisitors will raise tons of successors to the positions of full Inquisitors. Some build virtually private armies of supporters, indoctrinate them in their own specific form of beliefs as to how the Inquisition is supposed to function and then build their own power networks. Others spend their entire lives creating one single solitary perfect successor. Others might never even bother mentoring a single solitary agent to that position. But all must be approved by either three other Inquisitors or an Inquisitor Lord before they are actually allowed to be recognized as full Inquisitors. Now you can see the problem here, for example an Inquisitor Lord could potentially rubber stamp an infinite number of supporters, though such things are usually frowned upon and you must take into consideration the wider politicking of the Inquisition. An Inquisitor Lord that does this is very swift going to be recognized as a overt and obvious threat to the other political factions within the Inquisition who will probably make moves against him for reasons of simple self-preservation.
It is also theoretically possible for a successor to take up the role of an Inquisitor temporarily, mind you, after his mentor's death. Should an Inquisitor be killed in combat, for example, or the victim of assassination, yada yada yada, the countless ways in which an Inquisitor can reach the end of his career. But this is, again, I stress, a temporary position of power that can be repealed officially by any other Inquisitor, and usually is, at least awaiting an official hearing and acceptance of the successor. But once we are on a bit more of the point of inquisitorial politics as well, and the exceptions of successors, because again, if you need to convince three other Inquisitors that your chosen prodigy is worthy of the Rosetta, you might need to play some politics, you might need to engage in some horse trading, you might need to call in some favours maybe. How is all of this done then? Well, the Inquisition, as mentioned, is often divided into various um, orders and spheres of influence. These are not hard boundaries. A member of the Ordo Xenos can cross over to the Ordo Hereticus, or to Malus, or vice versa, etc. They can even exit these Ordos to join local minor Ordos as well. They can go back and forth if they so choose, though this tends to cause a little bit of ripples in the official politics. The politics is essentially made up of the individual inquisitors themselves who have their own goals and ambitions, then the various ordos of which they are a part, and then the various philosophies and ideas that they hold. For example, the Ordo Hereticus might be in outright competition with Xenos over authority in a specific area, or they might uh, be arguing whether or not a specific threat is of a heretic nature or a Xenos nature? Are these people being mind controlled by an alien or are they simple chaos traitors? You know, the usual. Uh, minor orders might be in conflict on um, specific points of principle or ethics or well, simple tradition or behaviour. Philosophies too might clash frequently. Generally speaking, the Inquisition can be divided extraordinarily roughly into two directions. There are the Puritans and there are the Radicals. I kind of hate this description myself because it's a bit too reminiscent of the left-right idea of modern day politics, which completely fails to encapsulate the breadth of ideas that can be found within these Again, exceptionally rough groupings. For example, a, a radical can be anything from a hardcore Xanthite, uh, believing that wielding chaos artifacts is the only right thing to do and must be done, to someone that merely believes that studying chaos is worthwhile. Knowing what chaos is is worthwhile because it allows them to unsummon demons, to banish them more easily. Same with a Puritan. There might be a Puritan who agrees on the idea of studying chaos grimoires for banishment um, spells, but there might also be a Puritan who is of the opinion that any contact with chaos, no matter what, is distasteful in the extreme and must not be done almost at all. There are inquisitors who deeply dislike and distrust uh, navigators and astropaths, who treat them as straight up slaves on their own vessels, as tools, and who want to reduce their status within the Imperium to just that, replaceable parts that you slot into a machine's engines. And of course, an Inquisitor's ideals might change over time. You might have a bright-eyed and bushy-tailed Puritan of the opinion that you cannot bend the rules no matter what, you must fight the righteous fight in the correct way, who, after failing at his job for a few decades, decides, okay, you know what, fine, I'll read just this one chaotic grimoire, and thus uncovers an entire cult because suddenly he can tap their bloody phone lines, their, uh, their psychic links with one another that has managed to avoid his notice up until that point. And suddenly, he's a radical, because holy hell, I just hauled in 10,000 actual chaos cultists by just reading a bloody book. Didn't do me any damage, I don't feel any different, etc. So obviously, I'm going to do this again. 
Or you might have somebody who has been raised by a radical, who already has that idea, but then sees his master fall to chaos. Straight up, becoming too radical, sacrificing imperial lives for no reasons. Maybe his successor even has to put him down, after getting his own Rosetta, of course. He might become the purest of Puritans in response to this. And obviously, these divides are constantly competing with one another for power, for influence, and for privilege. Now, that too might sound a little bit insane. After all, they have infinite authority. Surely they won't have any reason to argue. Well, there is always a reason to argue, because the only thing that can rein in an Inquisitor is another Inquisitor, and whilst they by and large wish to be left alone, if a more ambitious Inquisitor decides that you're stepping in on his turf, the only way you can protect yourself is to have friends in higher places, is to have allies, is to have people willing to argue on your behalf. Otherwise, you might find yourself on the receiving end of an official tribunal, with no idea as to how he even got here. You might be censored or pressured out. You might be simply told to go away by a group of Inquisitors, at which point you either need to risk getting killed as a minor inconvenience or, well, going away. For all of their higher ideals, the Inquisition is just as vulnerable to internal squabbles as any other Imperial organization. It is a simple part of being human. But do not make the mistake of thinking that this means that all Inquisitors will be solitary all the time, or will never cooperate in any shape or form. It is relatively rare for two Inquisitors to cooperate on a single target, a single objective, or um, a single cell of heretics, outside of the more rigidly ordered Ordos, that is, at least. Because, well, that is a larger scale form of cooperation already. But there are instances where individual Inquisitors can team up for temporary periods to solve particular mysteries, objectives. They might even form organizations that aren't quite Ordos on a permanent or semi-permanent basis. These arrangements could be as unofficial and fleeting as two Inquisitors simply deciding to join forces for an operation, or to um, delineate areas of responsibilities between one another. Basically as simple as a uh, conversation. You go over there, I go over there, we see what we figure out. Or they could be highly rigid organizations and very official ones within the Inquisition, like for example, Conclaves. Conclaves are mini ordos in a way, but rather than being created for specific purposes, specific questions, problems, or to study certain areas of law, they are divided up on a geographical basis, if geography can be applied to space, that is. Regions is perhaps more accurate. Where a conclave may be in charge of a certain area of space, and it may be made up of any number of members. Its scope, scale, and authority thus also varies greatly. A conclave could, for example, be four or five Inquisitors, who have decided to work together to pool their already infinite resources, so pool their expertise would probably be more an apt descriptor, and to deal with all of the various higher level issues within that area. In some instances, like for example the Declaration of Exterminatus, or the assassination of a high-ranking Imperial official, you might be stepping on a lot of people's toes by doing so on your own personal authority. So it might be nice to have a governing body where you can reach out and go, hey, so I want to kill this guy, this is my evidence, does anyone have a problem with that? And it could be put up for discussion amongst the regional authorities amongst the Inquisition. If nobody's got an issue, well, the mission simply goes ahead. If there are objections, they can be aired and discussed. And discussion really is the primary purpose of a conclave, as there is also another form of conclave. We've mentioned at several points previously that an Inquisitor can accuse another of malfeasance, and so they will be brought up to a court. Well, this court is usually a conclave of Inquisitors, that will then hear all of the evidence for or against the person, and then eventually come to a conclusion as to whether or not they are guilty. 
Upon the completion of such a uh, trial, however, the conclave would of course be disbanded, whereas the more official regional conclaves can be, well, quite permanent. Not always, mind you, some will wax and vain in terms of relevance. An area might be infested with traitors, heretics, and xenos for a hundred years, and then be completely devoid of activity for 200, meaning that the presence of a conclave is no longer needed. As to the conclave scope and scale, again, it varies tremendously. It could be five dudes in a room who have annual meetings on a space station somewhere, or it could be a major organization with bases, fortresses, shared adepts, resources, entire goddamn armies and fleets potentially, depending upon the scope and scale of their responsibilities. Many of the more scholarly ordos as well, those who dedicate themselves to research and archiving of certain questions, tend to form such conclaves, creating large-scale fortresses within which they hide and catalogue all of their knowledge, also making it available to other inquisitors upon request or via invitation. Seeing as a lot of this data literally needs to be compiled and stored, having a central organization to do so is obviously highly beneficial. Other organizations could be cabals or cells. The first there cabal immediately has a bit of a nasty ring to it, doesn't it? But it's nothing religious or heretical necessarily. It is simply a group of inquisitors that have decided to enter into a partnership for any amount of time in a semi-official capacity. This is usually to investigate a specific thing, like a uh, occurrence of chaotic manifestations on a planet, or tracing the lineage of a demon weapon, or hunting down a traitorous sorcerer, etc., or solving a particularly difficult mystery or quandary. Whereas a cell is a far more ad hoc organization which might be created to solve a case, rather than a broader field of investigation, it could be the disappearance of a particular individual, or hunting down a low-level criminal gang suspected of dabbling in things best left undabbled with. And of course, there are also de facto alliances between inquisitors. I mentioned previously the idea of an inquisitor raising up several successors, several pupils, several adepts, and then raising them to the full rank of inquisitor, thereby building himself his own private little army of inquisitors. It's a bit more of an extremist example, obviously, but by and large a master and his pupil will have a fairly close relationship, and will often share intelligence, data, agents even, and bases with one another. This doesn't need to be on the basis of master and pupil or anything, it could simply be two inquisitors that grow to be friends over the millennia that they stay alive. It might be regional alliances, kind of like conclaves, but not on an actual organization level, simply knowing that, oh hey, I am over here and my buddy's over there, so obviously we're going to share some intel. There might be uh, temporary alliances on certain systems. One inquisitor knows that he needs to enter another's turf to continue an investigation, in which case it is um, not required, but it's common courtesy to at least you know, show up and go, hey, I'm over here, you know, I'm going to do some stuff, maybe uh, let me do it, and to make sure that you don't step on anyone else's toes, as that too is a big deal within the Inquisition. Bearing in mind, this is a super secretive organization that the average Joe has essentially no knowledge of whatsoever. You can't exactly just, you know, look up the yellow pages and figure out where another Inquisitor is operating or what he's doing at any given time. In fact, there might not be any records whatsoever, as the Inquisitors aren't required to, you know, hand in any paperwork or reports. As such, you have no idea if the criminal kingpin you just arrested is actually a heretic, it's a likely case scenario, or if he's a a deep cover plant operative for another inquisitor. 
unlikely again, but it is absolutely possible, and it is a thing that has led to more than one conflict between Inquisitors, as they've um, unwittingly interfered with one another's operations. This can even lead to straight up feuds, which are to be avoided considering the potentially devastating consequences. There are also, of course, uh, conclave is the incorrect word, factions within factions is perhaps more accurate, within the larger Ordos, within the factions and the Ordo Minoris, where there will be a group of Xanthites who have a specific interpretation of their creed, and another group of Xanthites with a completely different interpretation. These are not necessarily working together on anything in terms of their actual jobs, they might not be cooperating directly in any other way, but they've got one another's back in the great game of politics, creating another form of unofficial cooperation amongst Inquisitors. And, of course, then there is also the Higher Lords of Terror, amongst which are often inquisitorial members, the highest ranked inquisitors within an organization that again, theoretically, technically, doesn't have ranks. These, the most equal amongst equals, are often requested to approve of other various semi or permanent organizations. A conclave, for example, should usually be formed only with the approval of one of the Lords of Terror's inquisitorial representatives. It's not always done quite according to book, but theoretically, all conclaves should be on the books in some way, shape, or form with the highest leadership of the Inquisition. But I think it's time we finally begin wrapping up, so today, hopefully, I've given you an idea of what the Inquisition is on a more generalized basis, its methods of operations, its internal structures, its ideas, its powers, and the emphasis on inquisitorial politics. Because again, even though they are theoretically all-powerful, God is only as strong as the God living next door again. There are still quite a lot of things we haven't touched upon, like again the various minor orders, the various political factions, and separate beliefs within the Inquisitions, but these are fairly sizable subjects in and of themselves. Not to mention, we haven't even talked about various Inquisitors of note, like Gregor Eisenhorn, or his almost as famous disciple Gideon Ravenor. But I'm sure we'll get to all of these subjects and more in time. Plus, I'm even going to start considering talking about Eisenhorn or Gideon. I've got a lot of books to reread first. Ah, uh, it reminds me, Cyphus Cain. I do need to cover him at some point, as he too had quite a lot of dealings with the Inquisition, but um, <laughs> it's a few thousand pages. Until next time, I have been Arch, thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.